Uh, turn with me to, to begin with to Genesis chapter 49. We'll start off there. Who can't hear? Are oh, you want me to turn this up a little? How about that? Is that any better? Is that better? Can you hear me okay now? Okay. Uh, uh, while y'all turn to Genesis 49, I want to read one verse out of Revelation chapter 5. Verse 5 says, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Now that verse, of course, is talking about Jesus, Christ Jesus, the line of the tribe of Judah. Because Judah, the tribe of Judah, is represented as a lion, and, and that's their sign, that's their signet, that's their banner, the lion. And in Genesis chapter 49, We'll see where that comes from. When uh, the, the, the chapter 49 is uh, Jacob or Israel, who is blessing his sons, who are the leaders of the twelve tribes of Israel. That's where these. That's where this is where these tribes get their names from. It's where they get their blessings from. Where the twelve, the tribe of Dan, the tribe of Benjamin, the tribe of Judah, uh, and on and on and on. And in verses uh, eight through ten. Well, I want to read about Judah. Judah, starting in verse 8, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Or in other words, your brothers. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey. My son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion, as an, and as an old lion, who will rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now the scepter in that verse, the scepter represents the rule, the government. Remember in Isaiah what it said, he shall be born and his government shall be on his shoulders. That scepter of rule shall be on him. Shiloh is of course the Messiah. Shiloh is the Christ. Shiloh is Jesus. When that Shiloh comes, the government shall be on him. And it will always stay within the line of Judah. The bloodline, the royal line, will all come from Judah all the way through to Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus is known as the line of the tribe of Judah. He, will, he is the ruler. That's where this tribe, this, this bloodline, this line, that's where it's headed to. That's where this is going. Now this is where it started right here with Judah, with Jacob or Israel blessing his son Judah and telling him that. It will always be in his line. It will never go away. It will never depart until Shiloh come. Now, look at uh, Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. Ruth chapter 1 verse 1 says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah. This man lived in Bethlehem of the tribe of Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Now flip over to chapter 4 of Ruth. Well, we've been through the story of Ruth. Everybody knows the story of Ruth. Ruth. They went over Ruth and Naomi. Everybody remembers the story of Ruth and Naomi and Boaz, the kinsman redeemer. And at the end, this child was born. Look in, in, in chapter 4, verse 17. And the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed. 
He is the father of Jesse, who is the father of David. David is born in the line of Judah. He is born in the kingly line. He came through that line. Now look in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Here in 2 Samuel chapter 7, David started feeling guilty because he was living in a nice house. In the Ark of the Covenant, the temple hadn't been built yet. In the Ark of the Covenant, David was feeling guilty because the covenant was the Ark was still in tents. It was still in the curtains. It was still set up in the tabernacle that Moses had built all the many years ago. He was living in a nice house in the city of David, and he felt bad about it. And he told Nathan, the prophet, he said, I want to build a house for my Lord. Well, in, starting in verse 10, Nathan came back to him. Nathan at first told him, said, do all that your heart desires. Do whatever your heart desires. Well, that night God came to Nathan, and he spoke to to Nathan, he said, go back and tell David this. And in verse 10, Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thy enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee in house. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of man and with the stripes of the children of man. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak to David. So David desired to build God a house, and God said, you can't build me a house, but instead here's what I'm going to promise you. I'm going to make you a promise. Somebody from your line, somebody from your seed, your family, and, and your family line is forever and ever and ever going to sit on the throne. You're going to rule. That's why when we hear people talk about it today, we hear people talk about Jesus is coming back and he's going to sit on the throne of his father David because that was promised to David way back then. And this promise still stands. It's still coming. It's still on the way. Jesus is still going to come back and he's still going to reign in Jerusalem and he's still going to sit on the throne of his father David whom God promised to David through Nathan. All the many years ago. And that line, that kingly line, starting with David and worked its way all the way up to where we're at right now in our study in the book of Ezekiel. The last three kings that lived. Because the 19th chapter of Ezekiel that we're going to read here in a minute is a lamentation. It's a dirge. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a heartfelt cry for the end of the line of the kings. Because the kings came to an end back then. That was it. That's the, the, it ended. It ended with, with Jehoiakim and Jehoiachin. It, it came to a stop. It came to a halt. And that is a lamentation to them, to the kings of Israel that had ruled. Uh, real quick, I'm going to read through these because there was a bunch of them. Starting with David and Solomon, and after him was Rehoboam, and after him was Abijah, and after him was Asa, and Jehoshaphat, and Jehoram, and Ahaziah, Athaliah, Jehoash, or Joash, Amaziah, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, Manasseh, Ammon, Josiah, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah, who was the last one. Zedekiah was the end of them. And we're going to read about these kings, this, this end of this, here in Ezekiel chapter 19, if you'll turn there with me. Now, that was just groundwork, so it would make a little bit more sense 
what we're talking about because you'll see in a minute when we start reading this you won't be as confused maybe hearing about the lines and the, and the whelps and the lines whelps because that's how this is presented it's presented as the lines and the whelp the princes the kings the kings of Israel that it's talking about here I'm just going to read through the whole chapter it's only 14 verses and then we'll go back and talk a little bit about some of the verses it's chapter 19 starting in verse 1 moreover thou take up a lamentation for the princes of Israel or the kings and say what is thy mother a lioness she lay down among lions she nourished her whelps among young lions she brought up one of her whelps it became a young lion and it learned to catch the prey it devoured men the nations also heard of him he was taken in their pit and they brought him with chains into the land of Egypt now when she saw that she had waited and her hope was lost then she took another of her whelps and made him a young lion and he went up and down among the lions he became a young lion and learned to catch the prey and devoured men and he knew their desolate palaces and he laid waste their cities and the land was desolate and the fullness thereof by the noise of his roaring then the nations set against him on every side from the provinces and spread their net over him he was taken in their pit and they put him in ward in chains and brought him to the king of Babylon. They brought him into holes that his voice should no more be heard upon the mountains of Israel. And then it changed gears here and it starts talking about Israel. It starts talking about Jerusalem. Thy mother is like a vine in thy blood planted by the waters. She was fruitful and full of branches by reason of many waters. And she had strong rods for the scepters of them that bear rule. And her stature was was exalted among the thick branches and she appeared in her height with the multitude of her branches but she was plucked up in fury she was cast down to the ground and the east wind dried up her fruit her strongholds were broken and withered the fire consumed them and now she is planted in the wilderness in a dry and thirsty ground and fire is gone out of a rod of her branches which hath devoured her fruit so that she hath no strong rod to be a scepter to rule this is a lamentation and shall be for a lamentation now let's go back to the first verse moreover in chapter 19 moreover take thou up a lamentation and a lamentation is just that it's a dirge it, it means it literally means to beat your chest to be upset about something to be miserable about something a lamentation it's not good it's it's it's, it's a crying thing it's a heartfelt thing it, it, it's a sorrowful thing because uh, again we've, we've taught this over and over and over again God is not happy about what he's having to do with the nation of Israel he's not getting any joy out of it we talked about that a lot last week he mentioned it twice in the previous chapter he takes no joy in the destruction of his people and he's not taking any joy in all of this it's all it's all coming about man is wrecking his plans man is doing these things against his will and going against god's will and they're rebelling against him and it's hurting him it's not it, it, it's hurting his heart this is a lamentation of god this is not ezekiel pining over this this is god pining over this through ezekiel because he gets no pleasure out of this so this is a dirge or it's a it, it, it's it's a, it's a lamentation of sorrow for the nation for for, for what has become verse 2 and say what is thy mother a lioness she lay down among the lions she nourished her whelps among the young lions remember a lioness that she lays down among the lions remember chapter 16 Remember the language that was used in chapter 16, the chapter of, 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 of identifying Israel with, with an unfaithful wife? She laid down among the lions. She's, she's done this to herself. She's brought this on herself by the things that she's done. The Israel we're talking about, the nation of Israel, the, the, the people as a whole, the nation has done this to herself. She's prostituted herself. She's laid down with whatever came along. She's nourished her whelps among the young lions. Look in Zephaniah chapter 3. 
Zephaniah chapter 3 is, is, is talking about this exact same thing. Talking about exactly what they're doing. Starting in verse 1. Woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressive city. She obeyed not the voice. She received not correction. She trusted not in the Lord. She drew not near to her God. Her princes within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves. They gnaw not the bones till the morrow. Her prophets are light and treacherous persons. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. The just Lord is in the midst thereof. He will not do iniquity. Every morning doth he bring his judgment to light. He faileth not, but the unjust knoweth no shame. What does it say in Jeremiah? His mercies are new every single morning. Do they accept them? No. Do they reject them? Yes. They reject them for their own ways. Over and over and over, every single day, He gives us an opportunity. Every single day, He gives them another opportunity to serve and to worship and to turn back and, and, and to treat Him and, and acknowledge Him for who He is. And they choose not to. Verse 6, I have cut off the nations. Their towers are desolate. I made their streets waste, that none passeth by. Their cities are destroyed, so that there is no man, that there is none inhabitant. I said, Surely thou wilt fear me, thou wilt receive instruction, so their dwelling should not be cut off. Howsoever, I punished them, but they rose early and corrupted all their doings. No matter what he did, no matter what he tried to say to them, no matter what he brought on them, what he brought about in their midst, they still... They corrupted themselves, they corrupted His Word, and they corrupted their life with Him. They turned and rejected Him over and over and over, time and again. We've read in Ezekiel that there's always a redemption. There's always a window for us to repent. There's always a place where we can turn and go back. But over time and time and time again, Israel did not. They did not. They rejected him and they would not turn and go back. And and, and, and again, it, it amazes me how this was written for this time, but it's applicable to our time. And what was going on then is exactly what's going on now. Nothing, there's, like I said last week, there's nothing new under the sun. Even the way we sin, even our iniquities, it's all the same. It, ha- it hadn't changed in all these years. Verse 4, the nations of the Gentiles also heard of him. He was taken in their pit, and they brought him with chains into the land of Egypt. Look at Second Kings chapter 23. chapter 23 verses 30 through 32 and his servants carried him in a chariot dead from Megiddo and brought him to Jerusalem and buried him in his own sepulcher and the people of the land took Jehoahaz the son of Josiah and anointed him and made him king in his father's stead Jehoahaz was 20 and 3 years old when he began to reign and he reigned 3 months in Jerusalem and his mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. And we go, we, as we go through here, these verses, breaking these down, verse by verse, we're going to be flipping back and forth between Kings and Chronicles a good bit. Because the, each one of these verses are describing something that happened. Each one of these verses are describing an actual action that a king made or a prince made. And this, this is because this dirge it describes in detail who these people were and what they did. You just have to dig it out. I can't take credit for this. This is somebody else did the bulk of this. I, I wish I could say I was smart enough to dig through here and dig all this information out. But I'm not quite that smart. Verse 5 of Ezekiel 19. Now when she saw that she had waited and her hope was lost... Then she took another of her whelps and made him a king. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 22. And we'll get a description of that. Jeremiah 22, 
too. They're not cooperating. Starting in verse 10. Weep ye not for the dead, neither bemoan him, but weep sore for him that goeth away. For he shall return no more, nor see his native country. For thus saith the Lord, touching Shalom, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, which reigned instead of Josiah his father, which went forth out of his place, he shall not return thither any more, but he shall die in the place where they have led him captive, and shall see this land no more. So that's describing in verse 5, when she, Israel, when she had waited and her hope was lost, because he's not coming back. He's gone. He's been exiled, and he's been killed in the place where he lived, and he's not coming back. And then she put another one of her whelps in place. Verse 6 of Ezekiel chapter 19. And he went up and down among the lions. He became a young lion and learned to catch the prey and devour men. And he knew their desolate places. And he laid waste their cities. And the land was desolate. And the fullness thereof by the noise of his roaring. Back again in Second Kings chapter 23. Starting in verse uh, 34. And Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim, the son of Josiah, king in the room of Josiah his father, and turned his name to Jehoiakim, and took Jehoahaz away. And he came to Egypt, and he died there. And Jehoiakim gave him the silver and the gold to Pharaoh, and he taxed the land to give the money according to the commandment of Pharaoh. He exacted the silver and the gold of the people of the land, of every one according to his taxation, he gave it unto Pharaoh Necho. <clears throat> Jehoiakim was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Zebuda, the daughter of Padiah of Rumah. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. So again, we have another description of what Ezekiel was saying here. When she saw that she had waited and her hope was lost, then she took another of her whelps and she made him a young lion. And he went up and down among the lions. And he became a young lion and he learned to catch the prey. And he devoured men. And he knew their desolate places. And he laid waste their cities and the land was desolate and the fullness thereof by the noise of his roaring. He took hold of this. He took hold of what he had been given. He took this kingship that he had been handed of the land and he turned to Pharaoh and Pharaoh gave him commandments and he started taxing the people he was taxing his own people so he could give Pharaoh what he wanted to he became a young lion he became exactly what Ezekiel was saying he did he turned in to that to that lion to that ruling and by the noise by the noise of his roaring it said he exacted he exacted his taxes on his own people and he gave it to Pharaoh Verse 8, Then the nations set against him on every side from the provinces and spread their net over him. And he was taken into their pit. And they put him in ward or in hooks. That, that word also is hooks, that, that ward, in chains. And brought him to the king of Babylon. They brought him into holds that his voice should no more be heard upon the mountains of Israel. Second Kings chapter 24. We get the description of this. Verse 2, And the Lord sent him against the bands of the Chaldees, and the bands of the Syrians, and the bands of the Moabites, and the bands of the children of Ammon, and sent them against Judah to destroy it, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke to his servants, the prophets. Surely at the commandment of the Lord came this upon Judah, to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he did, and also for the innocent blood that he shed, for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, which the Lord would now pardon. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? So we have, and it's breaking down in verses 1 through 9 of Ezekiel chapter 19. It's talking about lions and whelps and young whelps, but it's talking about its dirge. It's a, it's a lamentation for the end, for the acts and the end of the last three reigning and ruling kings that ever set 
on the throne in the temple that was destroyed later on. The next king who will ever sit on that throne is why we started out where we started is Christ Jesus. Because from this time, from this day forward, from this day until right now, the nation of Israel is still waiting on that king to show up. They're still waiting on the Messiah to come the first time. They thought when Jesus came the first time, when he was here before, they thought they, they accepted him at first. They accepted him for who he was, but they expected him to start killing people, to start taking over. They expected him to get on the throne. They expected him to start ruling and reigning as the sitting king, including and involving all of them and with it. The, the Sanhedrin and, and the ones that were, that were in power, of course they expected to remain in their places. But they expected if this was the Messiah, if Jesus was the Messiah who was coming, he was supposed to set up on his throne. He was supposed to get on the throne and start ruling and reigning the way these kings did. Because these came to an end in that day. We're waiting on Jesus to come back the second time. They're waiting on him to come the first time. They still haven't seen the Messiah that they're expecting to come and set up the, as king. Now, what's funny about this is the temple, the temple institute, the, 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 the people, the Jews, the, the Israel, the ones that are expecting and, and in charge of all this, the, the temple's complete. It's ready to be. It's ready to be built. Everything that they need, all the instruments, everything, all the rocks are cut, the stones are cut. And all they got to do is just start laying them in place and just stacking them up. It's like putting a Lego model together. It's ready to go. It's all there. And not only is it ready, but they have 3D models, computer models that you can you can go online on YouTube and you can take tours of it. And when, when you go online, when you go and take a tour of the temple and you go into the room where the Messiah's throne is. The Messiah's throne is sitting in a room with 74 other chairs because they still expect the Sanhedrin, they're not expecting to step down when he shows up. They won't, they're going to let him rule, but they expect to still have their seats, their places of authority. When, they, when they've got the, the temple that they've got laid out to build in the room where the Messiah, the ruler, the king is going to sit, they've got all these other seats for their person for there to sit, like, like a big council room. And that's not the way it's going to be. Because in Ezekiel's temple, when we get there, there's only one thing in that room, and that's one throne. That's it. That's, that's all that's there. I got news for these poor people. They're expecting, they're expecting a lot of things. But, but it's, it's, it's not funny, really. It's sad that, that, that they're expecting that because they're looking for that Messiah. They're looking for that king to come and rule over them. But yet, they have very steadfast plans made to be a part of that ruling, to be a part of that kingship, to be, and, and they have people in place that are ready to go to take these seats. There are people ready to move into this room and to sit down, these, these priests and these people of person, which if y'all paid any attention Sunday morning, there is no respect to person. With God, He has no respect of person for anybody. So it's, it's, it's just kind of sad. But this is, this is a dirt because it's coming. It's still in our future. It's still coming. Christ is going to come back, and He's going to rule. He's going to sit on this throne, this throne of David that was promised to David way back then that still hadn't been fulfilled. But like I said, He's coming back with His bride. He's coming back with the church. We're going to come back with Him, but we're not going to sit in the temple with Him. There's nothing about that being in the temple, even though we are His bride. Now, verse 10 through 14, it changes from the kings. In verse 10, Thy mother is like a vine in thy blood planted by the waters. She was fruitful and full of branches by reason of many waters. Remember we studied chapter 15 not that long ago about the, the useless vine. The vines become useless. The vine here, it says at one time, the vine, the root, the branches, they were all strong. They were strong at one time. Verse 11, she had strong rods. She had rods is, is what you rule with. Rules, the, the, the government, rules and laws. That, 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 that word rod represents laws and ruling. 
for scepters or rulers of them that bear rule and her stature was exalted among the thick branches and she appeared in her height with the multitude of her branches she was magnificent Israel was unbeatable it was she was untouchable in the days when we did the study on Solomon and the way he was there's never there never has been and never will be a richer nation on the face of the earth than there was in the day of Solomon they were unbeatable they were totally at peace all of their enemies God had put them to rest he had set their enemies down he had gave them total absolute peace absolute prosperity everything Solomon touched turned to solid gold and that eventually that brought him down but there was nothing touchable Israel there was nothing on earth that could touch Israel and they could come close to Jerusalem she did stand out she was strong her branches were thick and there were plenty of people there were plenty of strong men that were in line that could step up and take the throne and take the judgeship or the rulership at any time that's what this is saying verse 12 but she was plucked up in fury because she she rebelled because she rejected God and it started on a downhill plane. From the, as soon as Solomon closed his eyes in death, his two sons took over and split the whole, split the nation in half, the first thing that they did. And then both sides laid waste to idols and to idol worship. And they went back, they immediately went back to Egypt, to Egypt worship, to bugs. And, and when we read all about it, the, the bugs on the temple walls. And they built, and uh, Jeroboam went and built the, he built his own temple. He built his own calves. He said they worshiped all these split. The, 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 the downfall started as soon as Solomon died, as soon as he closed his eyes. She was plucked up in fury. She was cast down to the ground. And the east wind dried up her fruit. And the east wind here represents the attacking. All of it came from the east. Nebuchadnezzar from Egypt. All of this came from their east, from the eastern parts. The east wind, that's what that represents. Her strong rods were broken and withered, and the fire consumed them. There was nobody left that could take up the rule. There was nobody left that could that they could that was worthy. That, that, that was that wasn't. That everybody was corrupted. Everybody was turned against God. Everybody was doing their own thing and worshiping their own idols. There was nobody left. In verse 13, and now she is planted in the wilderness, or she's been exiled into Babylon in a dry and thirsty ground and fire has gone out of a rod of her branches which hath devoured her fruit so that she hath no strong rod to be a scepter to rule ever ever there's not another one there's never coming today the there's never coming the day this is saying until christ comes until jesus comes there's not anybody ever again going to be worthy to take up the scepter, to take up the rod, to rule over this people because they have all together turned their backs on and rejected God totally, totally for, for, all, these, for all these many years now. There's no one going to rule until the Messiah comes, until Christ comes and sets up His kingdom. Any questions or any comments about chapter 19? Okay.